Thank you, Savas, for the very nice introduction. Here's an outline of what I'm going to try to get through, if I don't get too stuck. Uh, I'll, just, I'll give you the two-slide introduction as to what particle physics is, just I'm not assuming everybody here is familiar with the field. I'll talk about the outstanding mysteries of particle physics, the things that are going to take us at least another 100 years to figure out. Um, uh, and then I'll start talking about things we're doing now and, and how I see the future going. So I will talk about the LHC because that is the biggest thing happening in particle physics. Uh, future colliders with the question mark. I'll explain the question mark. Uh, future of neutrinos, future of dark matter, and then I'll talk about some of these quantum connections. So what's particle physics? Particle physics is a very ambitious field. We, our goal basically is to uncover the most fundamental constituents of reality and decipher the rules by which they interact. So. That sounds really ambitious. It it's also sounds kind of vague because we don't know yet what are the ultimate constituents of reality. They might not be particles, for example. So it's, it's a very difficult and ambitious field. Uh, the rules are also always provisional. Uh, quantum mechanics seems to be on the list of rules. I think that's a pretty solid bet. Uh, symmetries turn out to be very important on the list of rules, but these again are things we're still trying to figure out. Uh, it also, just to confuse you, in, in particle physics, we often talk about things in terms of fields. It's because the actual uh, formalism that we use is relativistic quantum field theory. So in that, in that language, you, you see that particle physics is actually kind of easy because from our point of view, there's only one electron. There's one electron field in the, in the universe. And it's true that it's, there's about 10 to the 80 ex excitations of it, but we don't care about those details. We just care about the fact that there's an electron. So in that sense, it's a very simple field, and you're just trying to figure out what are the different fields, particles, and, and how do those things interact. Um, we think there's only one way of, of writing down a consistent relativistic quantum field theory formalism, but there's many ways of making models depending on what you throw in, degrees of freedom and particles. We spent the last 50 years figuring out 
um, what those ingredients are. And from that, you get this, this nice little chart here. Uh, this is what we call the standard model. There's 17 different particles that appear in, on this uh, plot. So that should already make you a little nervous. Why, why should there be 17 and not 12 or two or 100? Um, and they also have lots of interesting weird properties. Uh, there's six quarks, there's three charged leptons, including the electron, there's three kinds of neutrinos. So there's some interesting sort of numerology there and relations of those things. Uh, some of them are what we call matter particles, the ones that are fermions. Some of them are what we call force particles, the ones that are bosons. And then the most recent addition, the Higgs boson, which is sort of in a class by itself. It has no spin uh, and it's, it's, it's some different kind of a thing. So that's already pretty interesting. But if you're not interested in particles and, and how they interact, there's other interesting things that, that we think about, which I think are, uh, I think of general, uh, uh, both interest and application that connect other fields. One of these is sort of the growing realization that a lot of what we're trying to figure out in particle physics is really trying to understand the quantum vacuum. So empty space is not empty space. It's, it's a quantum thing. It's, it's, if you think about it in language of field theory, it's just the, the lowest energy uh, state that you can be in, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't have properties. It has properties. Um, we often talk about that in the language of virtual particles. We say, oh yeah, the vacuum has virtual particles in it, coming back to the uncertainty principle. And, and those virtual particles have effects and we can actually compute those effects. Uh, the, the most famous example of that is the magnetic moment of the electron, which you can both predict and measure to better than a part per billion accuracy. And that's a quantum calculation. So we understand some of the quantum physics having to do with the quantum vacuum at that level of accuracy and, and so far we are right. And in fact, there's an experiment running right now at Fermilab. Here you see Tammy Walton with our, the muon G minus two experiment at Fermilab where we're doing an analogous uh, comparison for muons, uh, measuring the magnetic moment with greater precision and then all the theorists are, are busy trying to improve on the theoretical prediction for that to see if those things agree or disagree. Then again, more recently, we have uh, our friend the Higgs. So there's, here's actually Mr. Higgs explaining uh, his, his theory at the Nobel Prize ceremony. So there is a Higgs boson particle, but there's also a Higgs field. The Higgs field is what's really interesting because again, it's everywhere. It's everywhere in the universe. Furthermore, it has weird properties. It, uh, for example, has the ability to source itself. So electromagnetic fields, if I want to make an electromagnetic field across the universe, I can do that, but I need sources, right? I need electric charges or something to do that. But the Higgs field doesn't care about that. It can source itself, it can turn itself on. And in fact, we think this happened. We think there was an actual moment after the Big Bang where the Higgs field decided to turn itself on. This is something we call the electric phase transition. And that was a really important event because when that, um, among other things, when that happened, 10 of those particles on my little chart uh, gained mass. So that's really interesting. How did that happen? Why did it happen the way it happened? Why did it happen some other way? Uh, those are the kinds of questions we think about. So here's my list, and this is not meant to be a complete list of mysteries that we're still trying to, to investigate. And I could end it here because the, the future of particle physics is to answer these questions. So once we're done with that, uh, they can stop funding us, but I think that's gonna take a long time. Uh, so how do neutrinos get mass? That's, that's something that's com not completely mysterious, but it is, uh, it's, there, there are a number of possibilities and we don't know which one is right. Uh, even in the case where we think we understand how the particles get their mass from the Higgs field, there's a lot of weird things going on. The top quark, for example, is 350,000 times heavier than the electron. So is, am I just supposed to say, well, so what? It's just a number, uh, I don't care. Or is it nature trying to tell us something? Um, there's things that we thought should have non-zero values that seem to have either zero or very tiny values. The, the neutron in the standard model you would have thought has a measurable electric dipole moment, but it doesn't. So something's wrong there. Um, why is there more matter than any matter left over from the Big Bang? That, that's very mysterious. Uh, it's also important because we wouldn't be here if that weren't true. Uh, we've had some ideas for what the mechanism is that would do that, but none of those mechanisms so far have have uh, been sufficiently supported by experiment that you could really say that's, that's the reason. Uh, dark matter, I'll, as I will assert later on, dark matter exists, but we don't know what it's made of. We don't know how it interacts with ordinary matter. Uh, there's very good evidence that there was a period of what we call cosmic inflation, a very rapid expansion shortly after the Big Bang. And there's also very good evidence that, that we are entering, have entered 
a billion or so years ago, another phase of accelerated expansion that we say is dark, due to something called dark energy, but we don't really understand the mechanism of either one of those things. Um, there's lots of things about the Higgs field that we don't understand. As I said, this mechanism of, tun of tur turning itself on. Uh, there's also the question of, of the stability of, of the vac quantum vacuum once you have this Higgs field around. Um, it appears at the moment that if you look at the parameters that we've measured for the Higgs boson, that we're right on the verge of living in a stable versus an unstable universe. And if we wait uh, 10 to the 500 years, uh, probably something bad is gonna happen. Uh, so what, is that nature trying to tell us something? Uh, what is that? Uh, and then there's all the mysteries that you probably heard a lot about that have to do with the uh, qu quantum properties of gravity, space, and time. So here's a, a shorter list of, of the same questions I was showing you before. Here, the point I wanted to make was uh, all the easy experiments in particle physics have been done. This is a very uh, mature field. In fact, all the hard experiments have been done. At least most of them have been done. So the ones we're trying to do now are the ones that were considered to be impossible. And the only reason they're going to be possible is because somebody, maybe somebody in this room, will have a technology breakthrough that will allow us to do an experiment that we thought was impossible. So that's, that's the nature of the field now. You get to a certain point in your field, that's, that's where you are. So let me now talk a little bit about things that are happening now and, and what I think the future are. So Large Hadron Collider is the biggest thing we're doing. You know, when your experiment is bigger than an airport, you're doing a big experiment. I think that's fair to say. Uh, there's all, all these GWIS statistics. I'm sure you've seen a lot of this, you know. Oh, oh, we need some magnets. How many magnets do we need? Oh, we need about 1,200. It's 40,000 tons of magnets. We need to cool them to two degrees Kelvin. Oh, how much liquid helium do you need? Oh, we need about 100 tons. How big is the pipe that the liquid helium has to circulate around? Oh, it's about this big around. All this stuff that they do at the LHC like it's nothing, and it's, it's just crazy. Uh, and, and then you're accelerating protons at very high energy and then they collide. How many times a day do they collide? You know, once or twice? That would be good enough for me. No, 40 million times a second we're gonna do this because that's what it takes to get the data because one in a trillion of those has a Higgs boson in it. And now I gotta build a detector. So that was just the accelerator. So now I build a detector. So the CMS detector, the experiment I'm associated with, it's a 14,000 tons of sensors. It's got about 100 million channels of readout. It's got, it has, just parts of it include the world's largest active solid state device and the world's largest superconducting solenoid magnet. And similar things for the Atlas detector. Uh, you, you start to worry about for these things because the collisions are happening so fast, you have to worry about the fact that it takes longer for a light signal to get from one side of your detector than the other than, than you have before the next collision comes. So think about the readout challenges uh, for these kinds of detectors with that rate of data. So what, what have they found so far? They discovered the Higgs boson. That's good. That's what this was built to do. Uh, there are many processes that the standard model predicted that had never been seen, that have now been seen and, and are studied. Uh, on the other hand, as Samus mentioned, there were lots of great ideas that we theorists had that they could have seen, uh, but so far they haven't seen, including supersymmetry, extra dimensions, black holes. I'm glad they didn't find black holes because that's not so good. Um, so what do we need to do with, with these incredible experiments? Well, obviously we need to study the Higgs boson more, including these self-interactions I talked about, which are sort of key to, to what we're interested in. Uh, a big thing we need to do is look for more Higgs bosons. It's the first of its kind, but you know, when we found the first quark, that didn't mean we were done looking for quarks. There may be more Higgs bosons, and, and they're hard to find, so it wouldn't be surprising if we hadn't found them. Uh, we can try to produce dark matter. If dark matter has uh, interactions with ordinary matter other than gravity. Maybe you can make it in these in these colliders. Uh, and then, you know, and we should keep looking because in the end, these, you're searching. So to do that, you need more data. This is just to impress you with two things. One is that the LHC is gonna run until 2038. So these are very long-term experiments. And the amount of data, it doesn't matter what the unit is, this is called an inverse femtobarm, but the, the unit of how much data you had at the time of the Higgs discovery was 11, and by the time they're done, it will be 4,000. So that's the kind of data that they're, they're trying to extract ultimately out of this machine. Uh, the way you get more data is by having even, even more collisions happening than I was talking about before. Uh, this, this creates problems for your detectors because uh, you, you take something that was complicated and you make it even more complicated and then you say, okay, now I'll go find the new thing that's in this big mess. And for that, you have to be constantly improving your technology. 
So here's an example of something that's going to be done for the CMS uh, upgrade of the CMS detector. For the, the low, low price of $300 million, we are going to improve this detector so that, among other things, instead of these uh, still photos that you see of these collisions, we're going to make movies of these collisions, essentially in effect. Um, ordinary movies have 30 frames per, per second. These uh, movies will have 30 billion frames per second because if you can do things, if you can get timing information at that, uh, that rate, you can actually start to, it makes it much easier to decipher what's going on in these complicated collisions. So that's a good thing. Another thing you can do to get smarter is to use AI. So everybody uses AI for everything nowadays. Um, but we have some interesting challenges here. If you want to use AI right at the point where you're taking data here to make decisions about is this event interesting enough to keep, which is a typical thing we want to know, you have to make your decision really fast. So I have to not just train my neural network, but I have to then be able to make decisions in, let's say, 100 nanoseconds. Does anybody know how to do that? No, because nobody else feels the need to do that because everybody else is living in an easy, an easy life. But the particle physicists have to figure this out. Otherwise, we can't use these techniques. So we are figuring this out. Everybody else is going to be using this in the future. But it's a good example of how we drive a technology because we have to, not because we want to. But in the end, we're going to make an advance in AI that's, that everybody else will benefit from. I mentioned dark matter. It's, it's easy to imagine that with all these collisions going on that if it's possible to make dark matter particles at all that you would make them, but then how would you know that you made them? Because they're dark and so you presumably make them and then they disappear. And for that you need clever ideas. One clever idea is actually to build a new detector that's, that's far, far away from where the collision is happening with the idea that maybe I make some dark matter particles and then far away where nothing much is happening anymore they might convert back into ordinary particles that I could detect. So that's an example of a new idea. It doesn't cost a huge amount of money compared to everything else I was talking about. So this is something called phaser, which has been approved to happen. It's going to be 480 meters from where the actual collisions are happening in the Atlas detector. And then they're going to look for uh, particles that shouldn't be there that could be produced because I made dark matter particles 480 meters away that converted back into ordinary particles. So this is a small investment compared to the LHC, but it, it could be the way that you see dark matter in these kinds of experiments. So that's all good. I, you know, I think this, I hope, gives you the idea for why we think high energy colliders are interesting and why it's, it's driven our field. But the next few slides are all the bad news about colliders. So first of all, it takes forever to do these things. It took us 40 years. The history of colliders goes back to the CERN SPS, which was in, in units of tera electron volts was 0.6. The Fermilab Tevatron was 2 in those units, and the LHC is 14. So it took you 40 years to get an improvement of less than 20 in energy. Um, you know, uh, the LHC cost about $10 billion in then year dollars. So I don't know what that would be if you built it today. And furthermore, there's a scaling law which was invented my, by my Fermilab uh, colleague, Vladimir Schultzlev, that says even in the best of all possible worlds where you are in, infinitely uh, intelligent, the cost of new colliders, the energy, uh, cost of new colliders scales with the energy at best like the square root of energy. It's actually pretty good because you might have thought it scales linearly. But that means a 100 TV version of the LHC will cost you at least $26 billion. And in fact, CERN, which is the only reputable place that's done an estimate of this, actually came up with essentially that number. So if you have $26 billion, please see me after the, the talk. Uh, there are people very seriously planning to build such a machine either at CERN. So now here you see, you can't even see the airport anymore because it's too small, but the LHC is the little ring and, and the, the proposed uh, collider called FCC is, is the big ring. Uh, you could build this in China. It's cheaper to do some things in China. It's not cheaper to do everything in China. You'd have to, for example, import physicists to do this because they don't have enough people to do this sort of project. Uh, the other thing that's sobering is the time scale. There's a slide here I stole from Fabiola Giannotti. She showed this last spring at a planning meeting in, in Spain. And everybody was uh, sobered by the, the year 2064, which is the most optimistic date that she was willing to show in public for when you might have a collider like this. So that's great if they have this in 2064, but I'm not going to be around for that. So I'm, in some sense, more interested in things that are happening quicker. There is one example of a new collider that is, I would call, shovel-ready. 
and this is called the International Linear Collider. This is not a proton-proton collider. It would be an E plus E minus collider. It would actually be in a straight line. It uses uh, superconducting RF accelerator technology to build a straight line, single shot, if you like, collider. It would be at much lower energy. It would be about 250 GeV, but that's good enough to make Higgs bosons. So if what you're really interested in is Higgs bosons, and I can make a zillion Higgs bosons and study them with great precision, this is not a bad deal. It would cost uh, approximately the same as what the LHC cost. So we actually tried to sell the US government on this and they said it's still too expensive, but the Japanese government is thinking about it. They haven't said no. Uh, they may eventually stay, say no, but uh, this is at least shovel ready. We at Fermilab know how to build this superconducting RF. We've actually built, uh, I think, two of the cryo modules that you would need to build this thing. You need a, another couple thousand besides those two, but we know how to build them. And if, we got, if Japan said we're gonna build this, we could start tomorrow. Basically. Okay, so that's it for colliders. I'm gonna now, every, the rest of my talk is gonna be things where you don't need billion dollar colliders in order to do stuff. And I think a lot of the future of the field is gonna be more moving in this direction. Yeah. What about doubling the LHC energy? Yeah, so this was very much discussed at this European strategy meeting. The claim was, so, so Savas's question was, why don't you just take the LHC tunnel and build a better accelerator with say twice the energy in the tunnel you already have? They have investigated this possibility. It, the claim is that it's not necessarily a lot faster or a lot cheaper because you still need to put in magnets that don't exist today. So it requires you do the R&D for the technology for the magnets uh, and, and, and therefore you can't start it tomorrow as I was saying for the ILC, which makes it less attractive because now you're still waiting 20 years, but now you're waiting 20 years for something that only gives you a factor of two in energy. So that's why the CERN people are not jumping up and down to do this. I still think it's an interesting idea, and it might be the one, only one you can do in the end, so. But 20 years would mean that in 2040. Yeah, 20, 2040, 2045 is still better than 2065. Exactly. Yeah. Some of us may still Some of us, that. some of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I've been pushing this, because you got to be realistic at some point, right? I didn't okay. think that magnets were so challenging. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about neutrinos and dark matter. So first of all, why are we interested in them? They are the dominant form of matter in the universe. There's, there's more, of, if you look at the matter particles, there's more dark matter than everything else by, by weight. Uh, and there's more neutrinos, at least by count, than there are other particles. Uh, they're certainly very important. There's lots of them. Neutrinos are produced in all kinds of ways, including with accelerators, so we can study them. Uh, and dark matter is here whether you like it or not. It's blowing through this room at 200 kilometers a second. So you, it's just a question of can you detect it in the laboratory. So the real question here is, is how you make sensors that are sufficiently advanced that you can detect these things. Uh, in the case of neutrinos, you want to detect them better. In the case of dark matter, you just want to detect them at all because nobody's done it. So let me start with neutrinos, which is easier. We, we know how to detect neutrinos. We're trying to improve our ability to study them. That means new technologies, one of which, uh, although it's, it's not, the idea is not new, but the realization is new, is using liquid argon uh, TPCs, which is basically, it's a tank of liquid argon that you charge up to very high voltage, and then every once in a while a neutrino does something, and then you're able to collect both electrons and light from, from whatever the neutrino did, and figure out what was going on in, in, in really impressive detail uh, with the effect of neutrino interactions. So we think that's a big part of the future of neutrino experiments, is having better detectors. The other thing you need is neutrino beams. If you really want to study neutrinos, you'd like to have a, a, a lot of neutrinos and neutrinos that you know what they are so that you know what you started with and then you can figure out what you ended up with. Uh, it's not so easy to make neutrino beams. In fact, the people that first figured out how to do this won a Nobel Prize for that. So that's, that's itself a big deal. You basically do it by uh, shooting protons into a target. Uh, you make a bunch of other unstable particles, in particular pions, which are charged particles. You try to focus those pions before they decay so that they're going more or less in the same direction, and then when they decay, they make neutrinos that are going more or less in the same direction. So we're doing that at Fermilab. We have two neutrino beams now, and we're building the third one. So we, we have that part solved. We're interested in neutrinos partly because they are nature's Schrodinger's cat. They're produced, so we produce them uh, in association with a, a muon from pion decay, as you see here. 
Uh, but they're actually, we, we know because neutrinos have mass, they're produced in a quantum superposition of three different mass eigenstates. So they're produced in a superposition. They then go on some long journey where they just do their own thing. They don't necessarily have to interact with anything. But because they're in a quantum superposition and we let them go over, over some uh, time and distance, when we measure them later on in a neutrino detector, they'll be in a diff they can be in a, in a, a different uh, flavor state. And so the neutrino you start with is not necessarily the neutrino that you end up with. So that's interesting all in itself, but the thing we're really after now is not that. It's actually using that process to figure out whether neutrinos violate CP. So this gets back to the question of why there's a difference between matter and antimatter in the universe as we observe it. That presumably has to do with some particle interactions that are violating the symmetry between matter and antimatter. So what we really want to do is, is take the same process I just told you with neutrino beams and repeat it once with uh, neutrinos produced in association with positively charged muons and, and then again with negatively charged muons, their antiparticles. Now you notice when I said that, I didn't talk about making beams of neutrinos and beams of antineutrinos because that's a trick question. We don't actually know if neutrinos and antineutrinos are different things. And this is another very important question about neutrinos. And in fact, this is a whole different set of experiments, that the very challenging experiments that people are doing. The other matter particles in the standard model, they have charges, and the antiparticles exist, and they're different particles because they have the opposite charge, so you're done. In the case of neutrinos, this question is a more difficult question. They could have distinct antiparticles, or they could be their own antiparticle, in the same way that a photon is its own antiparticle. And we don't know the difference, and this actually makes a big difference in terms of understanding the other things we're interested in with neutrinos. So this is something that's going on here. Giorgio is, is, is a leader in this whole field. These are very, very challenging experiments with not guaranteed to succeed. Um, but, but we need to know this. We need to know uh, this fact about neutrinos. So let me get back to the neutrino oscillations. So I said we want to make really good neutrino beams. So we know how to do that. That's good. I want to send them a really long distance because in order for them to, the superposition to change, it, because they have very, very small mass differences, which is the only reason why their quantum state changes, you have to send them hundreds or thousands of kilometers. So we can do that. We can send a neutrino beam from Illinois to South Dakota, no problem. Then when they get there, you need to detect them with the, the most sophisticated detectors you can afford. But they also have to be really large, otherwise you're not going to see anything. So that's a question of what's the fanciest detectors you can afford. And then you'd like to put them a mile underground because you don't want to have to worry about cosmic rays and other stuff. So that's an experiment called DUNE, the Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment. Uh, this is happening. Uh, it should start about 2025. It'll run for 20 years, sort of like the LHC in that sense. And the main point of it is to discover whether or not neutrinos violate CP. This would be a huge discovery if we can do it. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's the reason why there's more matter in the antimatter in the universe, but I think it would really point us in that direction. The other thing, there's lots of other things you can do with a big experiment like this. The other one I'm very interested in is, is supernovas. So every 30 years or so, we should get a supernova in our galaxy. There was one in 1987 that we actually detected neutrinos from. Uh, supernovas, uh, they actually need neutrinos to explode. They get most of their energy comes out in the form of neutrinos. So it's a good place. It's, it's a good source of neutrinos. Once you get one, you just got to wait around long enough to get one. Uh, and then there's really interesting things that happen uh, once uh, these supernovas start to collapse. You can have neutron star formation. So as the name implies, that means you have to make a lot of neutrons. And that actually happens in a very short period of time. I think it's like 100 milliseconds when you, you make a zillion neutrinos from the fact you make a zillion neutrons. And you, we're hoping to actually see that pulse of neutrinos from the formation of a neutron star. And then if, if you're really lucky and the neutron star is big enough, it keeps going and it makes a black hole. And then you're seeing us, uh, not just this pulse of neutrinos, but a constant stream of neutrinos coming from this, the, the remains of this supernova. But at some point, the black hole is getting bigger. Its horizon gets as big as, as the surface where the neutrinos are coming from. And you'll see the neutrino signal turn off. And that's sort of seconds time scale. So that would be pretty cool. If that's the only thing you do with the experiment, then I'm happy. But you've got to wait long enough. Uh, so this is all happening. This is just slides to convince you this is really happening. Um, 
you know, when you, when you do big construction underground, so we have to excavate uh, 800,000 tons of rock to make room for the neutrino detectors. For that, you need big construction equipment, but it has to all go down an elevator. And so all this construction equipment is made to take apart so you can take it down an elevator and put it back together again. So all, all the crazy things you have to do through these experiments, is, it's, it's just mind boggling that people even try to do these things. And then you need an international collaboration because this is already of the scale where you can't, the, you can't just do it in the US, you need international collaborators. So we've got a thousand people from 34 countries uh, working on this. And this is all gonna happen. So this is something, this is the future for the next 30 years uh, for neutrino physics. Is, is gonna, a lot of it is gonna be this. It's not just this. This is not the only way to get at neutrinos. My other favorite way of, of doing this is to look out at the universe. Remember I told you that there's lots of neutrinos and they're really important and they've been around for a long time since the Big Bang. So they actually have had a big effect on the universe. So in particular, if you look at the cosmic microwave background, it is affected by the fact that there are neutrinos. And in fact, it cares about the mass of the neutrino. So if I'm interested in what the actual masses of neutrinos are, which is again, one of the things we haven't been able to measure, one way to do that is to look out at the sky at the cosmic microwave background. That's, that's a really crazy idea, but it's something that's already happening. The first go at this is gonna come from something called South Pole Telescope 3G. This is a microwave telescope. It's at the South Pole, so it's a good excuse to go to the South Pole. Uh, it's technologically very challenging. It's got 16,000 of these fancy transition edge sensors in order to get enough detail about the cosmic microwave background that you can do something. Uh, and it's gonna tell us lots of things. It, it's, uh, these experiments, they don't just do neutrinos, they're looking at cosmic inflation and lots of things they're interested in. And, and the one that's running now is just sort of the warm up for the one we really wanna do, which is called CNBS4, which will be more than 10 times bigger than this. So this is again, another 20 year sort of scale uh, project where we're gonna learn from the cosmic microwave background things about inflation, neutrinos, uh, all kinds of things about the universe. So that's a good introduction to dark matter. Dark matter, as I claimed, exists. Usually people talk about that in terms of rotation curves of galaxies. That's old fashioned, you should stop doing that. If you wanna know why dark matter exists, just go look at the results from the dark energy survey. So the dark energy service survey, which is a, a telescope survey just completed, uh, Fermilab built the camera for this thing. They surveyed 300 million galaxies. We didn't care about the galaxies, but we cared about the fact that the, the, both the distribution and the shapes, that the images that we see of the galaxies is affected by the dark matter distribution. And you can turn that around and make a map of dark matter. So here's a map of dark matter in, in this part of the sky that they looked at. And you wanna know dark matter exists? It's not only it exists, but here's a detailed map of its distribution in this part of the sky. Uh, we're gonna do even more of this with LSST, which is the super duper version of Dark Energy Survey. It's gonna look at 30 billion galaxies. This is something that uh, SLAC is involved in, in, and it's gonna be the, again, something that runs for a long time. It's gonna take us to the next level for this. So dark matter exists, that's good. How does it interact with ordinary matter? Nobody knows. It interacts gravitationally, otherwise I couldn't make the map that I showed you. How else does it interact? Well, we don't know. It could interact through the exchange of standard model forces. Uh, those could be the weak interactions. It could be the Higgs boson that can mediate a force. Or it could be some new weird exotic stuff that connects just dark matter to ordinary matter. And furthermore, the dark matter could interact with itself. It could have its own laws of physics. You know, nobody knows. So this is what we call the dark sector to represent the fact that it, there could be all kinds of complicated things happening associated with dark matter. Or maybe it just interacts with this gravitationally and that's all there is and you're gonna have to live with that and, and still figure out what dark matter is. The other bad news is, despite the fact that uh, theorists are very smart and have been thinking about this for a long time, we have only managed to narrow down the possible mass range of dark matter to 75 orders of magnitude. So it could be as light as 10 to the minus 22 electron volts, so that's pretty light or it could be uh, multiple solar masses, or it could be anywhere in between. And furthermore, there's a perfectly respectable theory model for every one of those possibilities. So if you're an experimentalist, uh, you, you can either throw up your hands or you can say, okay, I'm gonna go look at part of this mass range and figure out how would I detect dark matter if it was in this mass range. And the other thing I'll point out is that for the heavier part of this mass range, you're looking for particles. For the lighter part of this mass range, you're actually looking for waves 
because these particles, first of all, they have to be bosons just to make up a sufficient number to be the amount of dark matter we see. And furthermore, they have to be, you should think of it again as a field with a very high occupation number in order to get enough of these guys. So really, it's, it's not a part, individual particles hitting you. You're getting sloshed with waves of dark matter. So, so two very different things that you might be looking for. Now, in fact, uh, most of the experimental searches have not been trying to cover this whole mass range. They've been trying to cover a much smaller mass range around 100 GeV, where we, we're looking for what's called WIMP dark matter. This is a WIMP is for weakly interacting massive particles. There is theory motivation for this. It was a good first step for something to look at. Uh, first of all, this is dark matter that could have been produced in thermal equilibrium with ordinary matter. So that seems like a reasonable thing maybe to have happened. Uh, and then it might be interacting with us through ordinary weak interactions. That would be a nice thing if it were true. So that's a good thing to look for. So most of the experimental effort has been looking for that kind of dark matter. And this is just to give you an idea of the worldwide efforts uh, looking with many, many powerful experiments for that kind of dark matter. And the results are nobody has, well, nobody's seen anything that's been confirmed. So what we've been doing is, is setting limits. Uh, so it's been a very impressive experimental program. Uh, basically what these experiments have in common is they're all looking for a dark matter particle. It goes through this room, it hits a nucleus somewhere, and the nucleus recoils, and you look for the recoil of the nucleus uh, in various ways. So that's, that's a very good technique, very successful experiments, nobody saw anything. And eventually they have to stop looking unless they're going to be really ambitious because at some point these experiments just start to be, detect neutrinos because there's neutrinos everywhere and then you're just, they become neutrino detectors. That's what we call the neutrino floor. So what else are we going to do besides this? Well, uh, the mass range that people are actually looking at now can be extended down to lighter dark, dark matter particles without giving up this nice feature that things could have been in thermal equilibrium in, in the early universe. So this is what we call light dark matter. So this goes down to a mass of something like an MeV. That's an interesting thing to look for, but now it's very hard to do this experimental technique where you look for a nucleus recoiling because when an MeV, when a 200 kilometer per second MeV particle hits a nucleus, the nucleus says, doesn't even notice. So you need a different experimental techniques. Uh, and people are doing that. One, one way of doing this is to look not at nuclear recoils, but electron recoils. So that means you need really good uh, electron sensors. And we have an example of that called Sensei. And then another approach is actually to try to produce the light dark matter particles again in accelerators. And in fact, up at Slack, they're, they're hoping to build an experiment based on that. It's called LDMX. Let me talk a little bit about the, the sensors idea. So suppose I want a really good uh, electron sensor. And what I'm really worried about here is, is noise because if my sensor is always seeing five electrons worth of noise and I'm looking for one electron from the dark matter event, I'm not going to get anywhere. So how do you do that? Well, it turns out you can actually do that with conventional CCDs, um, but with a very clever technique for how you read out the signal. And, and, and with that clever technique, they're, they're known as skipper CCDs. This is something we've been pushing at Fermilab. They have essentially zero noise for, for all practical purposes. And you can make really good dark matter experiments using small mass quantities of these skipper CCDs, which are basically chips you want to have them made. Uh, and I give three examples of here of the kind of sensitivity you get from these, order, pushing down orders of magnitude below previous kinds of experiments. So there's, here's an example of something, relatively simple idea, and you go many orders of magnitude push in sensitivity. And it doesn't cost very much money because it's just a chip, you go and make it somewhere. So for a million dollars, you can do an, a dark matter experiment that gives you many orders of magnitude better sensitivity than what existed before. And in fact, these are such good uh, compact low mass detectors that we're even thinking about using them as neutrino detectors. I showed you neutrino detectors that weigh 70,000 tons. Uh, we think a 30 kilogram version of this that you could put in a backpack would be good enough to detect neutrinos from something like a nuclear reactor, which it turns out people other than me are interested in detecting because it tells you what's going on in the reactor. So that's another interesting application. Another possibility for dark matter, which I actually like a lot, is that it's something called the QCD axion. And the reason I like this a lot is because the QCD axion was invented for a reason that has nothing to do with dark matter. It has to do with that weird problem that the neutron doesn't have an electric dipole moment. So some very smart theorists, including Helen Quinn from here, 
uh, said, well, we have a simple mechanism to explain that, but it also predicts that there's a very light new particle called the axion, and you guys should go out and find it. Uh, unfortunately, it, it, although it predicts the relation between the mass of the axion and how it interacts with ordinary matter, uh, it doesn't predict the mass. So once again, there's a, there's a very orders of magnitude range of mass that you have to look for. But it does tell you how the dark matter couples to ordinary matter. It couples like to E dot B. So from that, I can make an experiment. So here's an example of an experiment called ADMX. This is the most successful experiment so far looking for QCD, looking for the possibility that the dark matter that's going through this room is QCD axions. The way you do that is you have a very cold resonant cavity. You hope that the resonant frequency of your cavity is the same as the mass of the dark matter axion. So that's, that's hard because you don't know what the mass is. Uh, you make it very cold so you have low noise. And then you're looking for a resonant signal that deposits about 10 to the minus 23 watts in your detector. So that's a pretty hard experiment to get that, that level of sensitivity. And it took them about 20 years to do that, but they have actually managed to do this. So we are now probing the possibility that, that dark matter is QCD axions with devices that have enough sensitivity to do that. Unfortunately, this, uh, the, the ADMX approach, although it's very successful, is, is doomed to failure as you go to higher mass axions. And this has to do with what's called the standard quantum limit, which is, it's, it's really a statement just from the uncertainty principle that even when you get your thermal noise down to zero by putting things in the dilution fridge, uh, you still have quantum noise from the fact that usually when you measure things, you're measuring, let's say, the position and the momentum, and so the uncertainty principle says there's sort of h-bar worth of stuff that you're just never going to get rid of. So that's, that's the rough way of talking about the fact that there's quantum noise that's, that's hard to avoid. And these axion experiments at the moment are living at the intersection of the blue line and the black line, so they're just sort of getting into the mass range where you have to worry about that problem. And as you see, the black line is, is going down while the blue line is going up. So at some point for these experiments to succeed, you have to figure out a way to get orders of magnitude below the standard quantum lim noise limit. So you have to become a very clever quantum mechanic. So there are very clever quantum mechanics. And in fact, I highly recommend this article from uh, Physics Today last June, which was written by some of the very clever quantum mechanics about how they're going to do this. And here's the very short version of one of the ways you can do this. You can actually use superconducting qubits, the same qubits that people are making quantum computers out of, or the same uh, principle, these little Josephs and Junction superconducting circuits. And the, you can use them as a way for counting whether or not my cavity has, has a photon in it that came, we hope, from an axion conversion. So how do you do that? You would like to do that in such a way that you don't get, you aren't uh, uh, bothered by this Heisenberg uncertainty limit. And the way you do that, the way you get around the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is that you measure things in such a way that you're only measuring one of the two factors that would go into the uncertainty principle. So if I'm talking about counting something, which I can express in terms of amplitude, I have to do the measurement in such a way that I measure the amplitude and get the count, but I don't care about the phase, which would be the conjugate variable. So that you can do by using superconducting qubits to read out your cavities. People knew you could do this, but we didn't actually have the technology either of qubits or cavities to try this. But it's now happening, and there's actual devices and actual data that prove now that you can do this. They're already something like uh, 50 times below the standard quantum limit for the devices that I'm showing you on this slide. And there's no reason why in principle you can't get five orders of magnitude better than that. So now we are really entering the world of quantum sensors in a big way. I should point out that Mark Kasevich, who's here, actually holds the world record for getting below the standard quantum limit. So it's a challenge to everybody else to beat his record. Records are meant to be broken. Uh, another example of using quantum technology, I mentioned uh, that we use superconducting RF cavities to do things like build accelerators. Uh, when you're building an accelerator, you want to get as many photons as you can into a cavity, it's sort of the opposite limit. So for an accelerator cavity, we have, say, 10 to the 25 microwave photons in a single cavity. Uh, if you want to use these as quantum devices, you want to be able to tell the difference and manipulate uh, single photons at a time. And, and, and you can do that, in principle, with the same kinds of cavities. So this is something that we're trying to do at Fermilab because being able to do both of those things in the same kinds of systems means you can do another kind of uh, experiment called a dark photon search. 
So here the idea is that I make 10 to the 25 ordinary photons. Some few of them actually convert to dark photons, which is the, the, the evil twin of photons in the dark center, sector. Why shouldn't there be photons in the dark sector? Uh, and then some fraction of those convert back in this other cavity, which is tuned to the same frequency, into ordinary photons. So maybe if you're lucky, I get one or a few photons that shouldn't be there in the other very quiet cavity. So that's an example of an experiment that if you already have this technology, it's easy to do. Here it is. We didn't even need to get funding for this. They just did it in their spare time. So this experiment, the dark SRF, dark photon experiment, it exists at Fermilab. Uh, you need to make it very cold, but we already have the, the equipment to do that. Uh, it's already done a preliminary run where it's, it's already uh, it has better sensitivity than any previous experiment of this type. And it will go orders of magnitude better than anything anybody else has done because we're using new technology that, that people didn't have before. So last but not least, my favorite example of this sort of crossover technology is, and now I'm showing Jason's picture, is MAGIS 100, the cold atom gradiometer that we're with this. So this is, I want to finish with the Stanford thing. It's a Stanford thing, but we're going to be doing it at Fermilab because it turns out Fermilab is the right place to do this. So this is going to be an incredibly sensitive quantum measuring device, the first of its kind. It's using the same ultra-cold strontium atoms that they use for the best atomic clocks. It's going to be using multiple cold atom ensembles in a 100 meter tall vertical vacuum pipe. That sounds really challenging. In fact, if they hadn't already done a, a 10 meter version of this here uh, on your campus, I wouldn't believe this is possible, but, but I've seen it with my own eyes. They, did, they know how to do this stuff. Uh, they, they drive these, these cold atoms with laser pulses in order to put them in superpositions of being on two different paths and then bring them back and get them to interfere. So you have actual cold atom inter interferometry going on here. Um, they have the world record for how, how far apart you can put a single atom in a superposition of being in two different places. Uh, the world record, as you see, is 54 centimeters, so that's, that's pretty good. We're going to improve on that in this, in this next version. Um, and, and the really amazing thing about this is a couple years ago, this was just an idea to try to do the 100 meter version of this. And now it's happening, it's funded, it's happening. So you don't have to wait, 20, you don't have to wait till 2065 to, to see these kinds of things happen. So why, why is Fermilab involved? Well, there's a couple reasons. One is if you want to do a 100 meter version of this, you need somebody that has a 100 meter shaft. So we have an underground area where we do neutrino experiments. It's about 100 meters deep. We have a 100 meter shaft, there's the shaft. Uh, you need somebody who knows how to build a 100 meter tall vacuum system. This is an ultra high vacuum system, magnetically shielded, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so we know how to do that. We usually make them horizontal because we, we make them for particle accelerators, but it's not that hard. Okay. So Linda Valerio has already designed this thing. She builds accelerators. Uh, so again, you don't have to wait 20 years to do it. We know how to do it. Uh, it's all just happening. So what are we going to do with this thing? Well. T to me, it's enough that it's just going to do this, this sort of uh, demonstrations of, of quantum mechanics on such a large scale. So you can now think about you know, an, an atom that doesn't know whether it's here or on the other side of this room. It's in, in a superposition of, of paths that are, that are meters apart. Uh, and so so uh, doing quantum mechanics on the scale of meters and seconds uh, in terms of, of superpositions. So t to me, that in itself is worth doing. Uh, this, uh, the funding that uh, they have is, includes R&D to actually make entangled atom sources. So you could think about doing entanglement eventually with atoms on this scale. So it's just mind boggling just in terms of what you are doing uh, in terms of quantum systems. But that's not how we got it funded from the Department of Energy. Uh, this is also not how we got it funded, although it's very interesting. Eventually you'd like to be able to make gravity wave detectors out of these devices. Uh, you should be able to do this. Probably a 100 meter device is not good enough to do this, but eventually this sort of device should be a good gravity wave detector. It's very interesting because the sensitivity would be in a lower frequency band than what you do with LIGO, but in principle si sensitive to the same sources. It's things like these black hole mergers, except you would see them first. You would see them maybe months before LIGO would see the final chirp. So that would be pretty cool. Uh, again, as I said, probably a 100 meter version isn't good enough to do this. You probably need, if you're going to do it on Earth, you probably need a 1,000 meter version of this. We have a 1,000 meter shaft too. It's in South Dakota. That's where the neutrino experiment is. So, so if that's what we need to do, we can probably do that. 
Anyway, this uh, we didn't sell it to DOE based on this either because they don't do gravity waves. But they do dark matter, so we sold, sold them on this. Uh, you might imagine if something is, is potentially sensitive to gravity waves, it's also uh, sensitive to other kinds of tiny disturbances. So for example, I remember I mentioned that ultralight dark matter, you can think of it as waves washing in from space. Uh, that has effects if you have, in, in principle, uh, on, on things that you can measure in these devices. We don't know for sure that it does, but it's certainly plausible that it does. And you wouldn't see those effects any other way because this device is just more sensitive than anything else you can build. So there's, there are certain kinds of ultralight dark matter where this is the first place they would show up. It's actually, it might also be the way that certain very heavy kinds of dark matter uh, here I, I drew it as an asteroid. You wouldn't actually see it as an asteroid, but think of very large composite dark objects that might be floating around in the solar system. and might be a way of seeing those as well. So this, I think, is incredibly exciting. It's, it's really happening. It'll be happening on the time scale of a few years. Uh, and it's going to be the start, I think, of a you know, 20, 30 year program because people are going to think of other things to do with this kind of technology. Um, and, it's, and it's really nice cross fertilization between different expertise from different fields. So in fact, I want to finish up pretty much with that kind of message. Uh, I started talking about what we call the, the energy frontier of high energy physics, where you build higher and higher energy colliders. Obviously, you can't do that forever. So what else can you do? Um, you can try to detect, um, have better sensitivity to very feeble interactions, like neutrinos and dark matter. That's what we usually call the intensity frontier. You can look out into the sky to see what nature is already doing out in the universe and what happened in the Big Bang. Um, but the thing that's new on this plot, and this is a plot I actually stole from John Presco and then uh, improved it to, to, for my own message. This overlap with, with quantum information and things that think, people think about in various kinds of, of non-trivial quantum systems is becoming more and more a unifying theme for everything we're doing in particle physics. It already was a very quantum field with a lot of uh, deep quantum questions. But the overlap now with what people think about in quantum information has become more explicit and, and I think uh, uh, also more interesting in terms of technolo technology overlaps. Uh, I didn't have time in this talk. I wanted to talk about these ideas that have to do with quantum gravity and in the quantum information side, some really interesting speculation that again involves people on this campus talking about maybe space time can be, should be thought about in the language of quantum information. Um, maybe black holes and, and even more exotic things like wormholes can be thought about in the language of quantum information. This, I think, is also a big part of our a future of our field because it's hard to go out and get a black hole. It's hard to go out and get a, a wormhole, even if they exist. But if you can map them into things that you can look at that are real quantum systems in the laboratory, maybe that's good enough. We can actually learn the same things that way. And in fact, uh, this is kind of a joke, but just for the hell of it. So. Quantum teleportation. Um, that's something that already exists. It was done a long time ago. Uh, we have a system at Fermilab now that does quantum teleportation. It doesn't actually look like this. It looks like that. Okay, so it's not less impressive. Um, so why is that interesting? Uh, one of the reasons it's interesting is that uh, your own Professor Lenny Suskind wrote a series of papers where he said, hey, not only are there wormholes, but wormholes are related to quantum teleportation. Uh, and with a little more funding, I'll tell you exactly how. And then you guys can go out and do something. So while we're waiting for him to get a little bit more funding, which I think he's already gotten, um, uh, we're actually building a setup which in principle could do, if you told me what was the protocol to do wormhole teleportation, we want to have the technology to be able to do it. And I think, you know, it's not crazy. It used to be crazy to even think about these things. It's not crazy to think about these things anymore. So I think that's, that's a sign of a, of a healthy field that that kind of thing is happening. All right, so, so this is just the, the summary of what I was trying to talk about. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of mysteries. We've got a lot of challenges. Everything is really hard, but, but there's lots of opportunities to do lots of new things, and, and people are taking those advantages. Uh, and, and starting lots of new things. Some of them are big projects, but they're not all big projects, and a lot of things are happening fast, and they're happening in university labs, and, and, and with the help of national labs like Fermilab, and I think it's, it's a really interesting, exciting time to be doing this stuff, so thank you. Are they going to be improving it? 
Yeah, so um, uh, the, the one that I showed you that they've already run, they ran it in what we call the vertical test stand, which is a big tub of liquid helium that they just happened to have. So they, and that's 1.4 degrees Kelvin. You'd really like to do it in a dilution fridge. So, uh, you know, they ordered a dilution fridge. It takes seven months to get it from Blue Forest, but it's all set up now. So I think uh, by next January, they'll have it in the dilution fridge. Um, then the other problem you have these experiments is, okay, I have this cavity, I have that cavity, but then I have other stuff around and you gotta make sure there's no crosstalk between the cavities. And of course, when you turn it on, that's the first thing you see. So how long does it take to actually get that under control? That's, that's the real thing. I have a question. Is there a concern about, at the LHC, about uh, brain drain, namely keeping very ambitious, smart experimentalists for long enough in yeah. this huge time scale, like between 2038 and 2064. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. so, so, so I, I showed you a couple of ways that in CMS we're trying to address this. So one was in the CMS upgrades, we tried to be as ambitious in the technology as possible, which we actually get pushback from the DOE on that. They were like, you know, why don't you just build the simplest thing possible because then your project is guaranteed to succeed. And we said, no, we need to make it challenging because if we don't make it challenging, you're gonna be running something boring in 2035 and there's gonna be nobody around to do it for you. Yeah. So these things like this picosecond timing that I talked about, it's precisely because we're trying to push the technology to, to keep it interesting and challenging and keep people doing that. That's in the hardware side. Then the software side, it's this stuff like, what can you do with AI that's, you know, not just, you know, machine learning on your Higgs analysis, but what can you do that's really transformative? Can we get rid of all of our s simulations that we use now and replace them with a neural network that you don't, you know, that can do it better? It's things that are really big changes in how we do things in the field. Now, none of what you mentioned is particle physics challenges there. Technology. Yes, that's correct. Challenges. So, the other thing is if you want challenging, why don't you try to improve the magnets and double the LHC? So we, so we are doing that at Fermilab. In fact, we have the world's record for the highest field accelerator quality magnet, which is 14 Tesla. It was set this year by Fermilab. Uh -huh. okay. And we're part of a consortium of labs that are, that are working on this. Um, the thing that, is, that makes this slow is that you basically, you know, you take six months or a year and you have some good idea and then you make a, a prototype magnet and you see whether your idea was good or not and then, and then you do it again. So it's sort of a you know six month to a year turnaround time, and so you say how many t you know so twenty steps takes ten years. Do you see a role for electron dipole moment searches? Yes. In fact, this is a conversation I have had with DOE High Energy Physics about you know it seems like we should be supporting the experiments that do this because it is kind of central to the questions of our field. And, and furthermore, they're not that expensive. So I, so this, so I haven't succeeded in in talking them into this yet. But I think maybe if we get a little more of the right pressure, this is something you know we're about to have a community exercise to talk about new experiments. I think we should try to move EDMs into the into high energy physics. Speaking of which, you know, I've always been uh, amazed by the fact that HPDOE does three out of the four fundamental interactions, but gravity, not their business. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing, right? How they are uh, things. Is there any hope that they'll see the light or well, they'll see the gravity? Also, neutrinos double beta decay. It's, uh, some properties exactly. of neutrinos are energy physics, and some are not. So. <laughs> yeah, but the boundary between nuclear physics and energy physics is well known. It's a well known mystery, yeah. and it's kind of a. But, but the, the, the gravity yeah. really doesn't belong to the right. at all. So, even more bizarre. So, so I mentioned, for people who don't know, we're about to do a community exercise called Snowmass, which is where the whole HP community gets together and, and we talk about the future of the field. So, so that's an opportunity to add some things to the, to the official list of things we were allowed to do and get funded for. So I think gravity waves and things, you know, gravity experiments in general is, actually, that's actually number one on my list. I think EDMs is another one that needs to be on that list, and there's probably two, two or three more things like that. Yeah. Question? Question? Yes. Sure. Okay. Um, way back at the turn of the present sen uh, century, I was part of a team that was put together by Bernie Malibu and Bill Foster. I think you're going to ask. We 
came up with a, uh, a 100 TeV centering matter center of mass proton collider. We called it the uh, pipetron. The yes, I remember it well. Under covers, we called it the Big Bang mm -hmm. It all seems possible, technically possible, if you actually build it today. Do you think it will ever happen? So, so I remember when Bill Foster was presenting this, and part of the idea there was that you could get utility companies or we're going to eventually convert to underground utilities because that's obviously the thing you need to do in order to do thing, avoid things like California burning down. <laughs> this apparently is not happening, even though it's the obvious thing to do. But the idea was if they're going to start building thousands of miles of underground you know, tunnels, you would, you'll build an accelerator that would fit in whatever they were building. And, and then you could do things much more cheaply. I thought that was a great idea. You know, Bill Foster's a congressman now. He has the ability to influence uh, things. Um, so maybe it'll happen. Yeah. One, uh, one more point about EDM to continue on Mark's point. EDM is also important for another reason. If there is a positive result, this will suggest new physics at relatively yeah. accessible Right. Potentially accessible yeah. energy. Should be. And should be a huge boost to. There was one more question. In the early days of the SSC, a study was made of synchrotron radiation from protons. Uh, it's very difficult to get. I mean, all charged particles make synchrotron radiation. Yes. Uh, but it goes with the fourth power of the mass, which is 13 orders of magnitude. But when you get to these extremely high energies, it also goes as E squared. So at some point, yeah. making radiation that could be very interesting. Mm -hmm. For example, a free proton laser. Uh, is there any thought being given to that at the LHC or future color? Yeah, I think they haven't gotten there yet, but it's, it's the kind of thing you've got to think about, right? Because you're really going to invest that kind of money. In, in a collider like that. You better have, you know, some other thing that it's good for. And that's, an, you know, that's a possible example. Okay. Let's thank Joe again. Make sure I take all this off. Yeah, thank you.